I do think that sports betting on a widespread, legalized basis in the United States is inevitable. On your point about reducing the number of games, ultimately I don't think that's something, one, that our, our fans necessarily want. Kobe's back. I'm gonna finally learn the triangle, <laughs> you know, since the Knicks are here in town and Phil's teaching it. Hello, we are very pleased to be joined here today at Bleacher Report by the Commissioner of the NBA, Adam Silver. Adam, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate you being here. My pleasure. It's, uh, it's an exciting time. NBA season's about to start. Your first opening night, actually, as Commissioner, although not your first opening night. Right. So many things going on. Kobe's return, Derek Rose's return, a lot of interesting storylines, and oh, by the way, LeBron's back in Cleveland. What's got you most intrigued about the upcoming season? Well, let me begin with opening night. It's, of course, the first time that I get to give out the rings. Yeah. So that's what I'm most excited about at the moment, and especially to such great champions as the San Antonio Spurs and a first-class organization. So that's a treat. You know, it's a, it's, it's a privilege as part of this job that I get to do that. But I'd say generally, I can't wait for the season. Um, you got a taste of it in the summer league with some of the rookies coming in. You know, as you know, a much-anticipated class as you said, Kobe's back. You know, I'm, I'm going to finally learn the triangle, you know, since the Knicks are here in town and Phil's teaching it. you got to watch Spike's movie. And I'm going to watch Spike's documentary explaining the triangle once and for all. So it's really just back to basketball. There's so many, in, in my job, there's so many things that don't relate to what happens on the court that I have to focus on that at root I'm a fan. And I can't remember a time when there were so many interesting storylines throughout the league. I think it's a testament in part to the collective bargaining agreement. You're probably gonna ask me about that, but I think it's working. I mean, putting aside the financial side of it, I mean, the percentage of BRI and all that, but I think the system elements, as you know, and you covered it extensively, were designed to create a more competitive league in terms of the distribution of players. And we're seeing that, and I think in addition, the fact that as the popularity of this game grows, more of the best athletes and more of the best athletes in the, around the world are turning to basketball. And I think you're seeing that in terms of the quality of the play on the court. Yeah, I, I would agree. And obviously the Eastern Conference becoming very competitive again. The West is obviously brutally competitive. So right. there is, I, I think, to a degree, a lot of parity, especially at the top of each. I wanted to ask you about, you did mention that a lot of the job, of course, is the off-the-court stuff. Right. Board of Governors meeting recently, lottery reform did not pass. Now, tanking was a huge issue last year. You said yourself there's a, a corrosive effect perception-wise, even if maybe it's not as widespread as people believe. Is lottery reform now dead or dormant? It, it's definitely not dead. So, as you know, a majority of the teams, 17 teams, voted in favor of the specific proposal that the competition committee had recommended to the board, but it requires a three-quarters vote to change our playing rules. And so, since a majority of the teams want something different, it's definitely not dead. I don't think there's quite a sense of urgency. As you know, We've tinkered with the draft lottery format multiple times over the years. And as I said the other day, I'm not necessarily dissatisfied with where we've come out in terms of the odds for the worst performing team versus the, you know, the other teams that don't make the playoffs. But you said it, I am concerned about the perception, not just the perception um, that teams may not be doing everything in their power to win games. But what I see as the increased pressure, actually, on general managers and even owners in this league to underperform, I mean, that's what's new. I don't remember any time in my history, there were, look, the, the very purpose that the lottery was put in place, and that was before I got to the league, was to disincentivize teams from having an incentive to have the worst record. I'm not gonna use the T word that you use. But what's happened now is, and I think it's the advent of analytics and a new genera generation of general managers and a lot more sophistication among the fans as well, that fans have adopted it as, in some, at, at least they've, there's a perception that it's a winning strategy. I don't necessarily agree with that, and I think the jury is out on the analytics. And I think part of it is the cultural elements 
of not being a winning organization. And I think Mark Cuban even said the other day too that when it may be an effective strategy if it's one team, but when you have multiple teams racing to the bottom, I think that it, it takes away the effectiveness for potentially all of those teams. So I do think it needs to be addressed. I, you know, I, I thought that was a very productive discussion in front of the board on the potential unintended consequences, and that's always the concern when you tinker with the, a program like the draft lottery because the teams are so sophisticated. I mean, and, and in a good way, it's they're, they're highly competitive and they're always looking for an edge. So I think the, the sense of the room was, again, clearly the majority of teams were voting for that specific proposal, but when it didn't pass, there was then a second resolution, in essence, that was, that, that was passed that, in which we agreed as a board that we needed to turn back to this. So we will. Is it inevitable then, do you think, a, a year from now there will be something, whether it was the timing that people quibbled with or whether it was the actual formula, are we going to see a different version in place maybe by this time next year? I don't want to say inevitable because the board is definitely not a rubber stamp. And whatever process we use in terms of a competition committee, I mean, I want to encourage a, f a very full conversation once we do get to the full board of owners. So I, I, I think it's likely, but, but we'll see. We'll see as this season goes on. I, I think also as there's more public attention focused on the issue, it may affect the behavior of our teams as well. Sure. Another area that you guys have kind of looked to maybe tinker with, you had a 44-minute preseason game trying that out. What did you want to see or get out of that? Was that about trying to decrease a little bit of the toll on players? Was that about more fitting into a time slot for your TV partners? Right. Uh, what, what did you want to see? All of the above. I mean, I, it was a fascinating experiment in that there's been a lot of discussion about length of game over the years not just in our sport, but in all sports. I think people have picked on baseball certainly more than our sport, but I always say when I was a kid, movies were two and a half hours long and now they're two hours. I think if you were designing the NBA from scratch today, I'm not sure if where we'd end up is with a two and a half hour game in terms of actual clock time. Of course, it's 48 minutes in terms of the game itself. I don't necessarily think the answer is fewer minutes to the game. I mean, our, it's not as if our fans are telling us they want to see fewer minutes on the court. Clearly our fans are telling us that we should take a fresh look at the format. I mean, remember in the 44 minute um, experiment, it wasn't just the reduction of clock time. We also took out two of the commercial breaks as well. Now, we have to balance the commercial needs of the league and the players against the entertainment value and the running time as well. But, I, but what, what was also beneficial with a 44-minute experiment is that it gets people thinking about the issue, maybe in the same reference back to the draft lottery, in that there's so many smart minds out there outside of the league, frankly, yours included and your colleagues at the Bleacher Report, that when you do a 44-minute experiment, what you get is a lot of free research that people weigh in and say, well, maybe not 44 minutes, but you know, maybe you should look at the format, maybe you should change um, the, the actual schedule. And that, for example, that's something we continue to look at. It may be that you know, ultimately in terms of the players, there are better ways to rest them than reduce the number of minutes. We're adding an all-star yeah. break this year or we're, we're lengthening the break. Back-to-backs are of course an issue for players and our teams and so maybe we need to begin the season a little bit earlier, reduce the preseason, go a little bit longer in June to space the season out a little bit more. So th those are all considerations, but th the good ideas continue to pour in after the 44 minute experiment. Yeah, no, and I, that was a very interesting discussion, as you said, that kind of got sparked by this and players immediately weighed in with, look, we're fine with 48 minute games, but could we play fewer than 82? Now, I'm not even gonna ask because I know that there are reasons revenue wise that I don't think the owners or players would ever go for that, but is it a reasonable uh, proposition to simply cut the preseason in half, start earlier, eliminate all back-to-backs if that's possible. Is that something that you think, uh, clearly the players would love to go that route. Is that a, a, a realistic uh, possibility for the league to pursue? Yeah, it is. I think that is something we'll take a close look at. I mean, there are rev revenue implications too for preseason. And when I say revenue implications, it's not just reducing 
the number of domestic preseason games. As you know, we've taken advantage of that opportunity that month of October to really grow our business internationally. I was in Berlin with the Spurs just two weeks ago. Then I went on to China with the Nets and the Kings. And, you know, we, in those markets, we get questions about bringing regular season games. But what I point out, especially in China, is that the fact that we play in the preseason gives us the luxury of coming over for multiple days, players spending time, sightseeing, you know, experiencing the culture, running clinics, doing charitable events, all kinds of things that we couldn't do if we just jumped, the players jumped on a plane, played a game overseas, and came back. So those are things we have to take into account in looking at the preseason. But the, I, I think the players are right. I mean, I, I think those are interesting suggestions. On your point about reducing the number of games, I also, ultimately, I don't think that's something, one, that our, our fans necessarily want. I understand from the players' standpoint, although they love the competition. I mean, I, I think if we reduce the number of seasons, it depends where the player, you know, wh whether you're on a winning team. I mean, remember, for a lot of our players, they finish their season in April. I mean, you could argue, I mean, for our better players, they're playing well into June. So there's that disparity right there, in, ultimately, in terms of number of games and minutes. Just real quickly, in terms of the goal, though, do you believe that you could possibly extend the length of your players' careers, and especially the elite ones who do have a lot more games from mid-April to mid-June, by reducing something, whether it's number of games, whether it's number of total minutes, whether it's number of preseason games, whether it's eliminating back-to-backs, do you think there is, is the medical case to be made out there that guys could have longer careers, fewer injuries by making one of these attempts? You, you know, Howard, the only thing I can say is I've learned the hard way in this business not necessarily, necessarily to trust my gut on an issue like that, but to look at the data. I think that's where analytics do come in. I mean, as you remember, when we were kids, guys took the entire summer off, you know, and training camp was the opportunity maybe to lose a few pounds that you had gained in the summer and truly get back in shape. I don't think anyone would suggest today that the fact that guys did virtually nothing in the summer was necessarily better health-wise and finding that right balance, because we know even if, even if players don't participate for their national, with their national team over the summer or aren't actively playing, they're working out hard, you know, and sometimes what I've heard from some of the trainers is that the, the repetitiveness of some of the things they're doing on their own instead of playing games isn't necessarily good, you know, in the long term for their tendons or, or their muscles. So I think we got to, we need more science here. And that's, that's something also that the league is taking very seriously. I mean, we're, you know, it, we had extensive discussions at the owners meeting about that as well. And that is, you know, what should we be doing collectively as a league in terms of gathering medical data? So there, there are always going to be competitive issues with teams, and some teams think they have the secret sauce in terms of rehab, in terms of the appropriate training. But I think the owners are increasingly of the view that at least a certain amount of that information should be shared because as a league, we all have an interest in extending the careers of our players, especially our star players. Yeah, absolutely. Now, one of the hallmarks, I would say, of your administration so far, your eight months as the commissioner, is the phrase, a fresh look. You want to take a fresh look at just about everything, and we've seen that with the, uh, the, the lottery potential The, the statute reform. of limitations is going to be up soon, right? On yeah, fresh at some look. point it's no yeah. longer fresh, I guess. Right, um, right. But you did extend the all-star break. There have been a number of, of these things where you basically said, you know what, why not go back to 2 2 one, one, one for the finals? Right. Why not have a longer all-star break? There's been a, a lot of that, and I think people have appreciated kind of that, that, uh, that fresh look. One of the things you threw out that I think caught people off guard a little bit, uh, middle of July, was why not have a mid-season tournament? And it kind of got everybody's attention, got a little bit of buzz going. We haven't heard much about it since. What's the likelihood of a, of a mid-season tournament? What would that look like? Well, by the way, I mean, that goes to the whole issue of length of season as well. Yeah. And I realize you can't just take the existing 82-game schedule, regular season plus playoffs, and then just plop another tournament down on top of it. I think you'd have to take a serious look at the all-star break if it were a mid-season tournament, the game itself, the events around All-Star, but conceivably what a mid-season tournament could look like is you could have some number of teams and it might, it, you, you could either begin with all the teams and have a single elimination type tournament. I think, again, it's another area where through floating the idea, I've gotten some really interesting suggestions over the transom, so to speak. It may be an opportunity to bring in some international clubs. I mean, there's been talk about the NBA sponsoring a world championship of types. Of course, there's the World Basketball World Cup now, which the U.S. 
participates, USA Basketball, but for the NBA, of course, club championships are very different. And we, I, and others at the league office have spent a lot of time studying the Champions League for European soccer, other types of cups and mid-season tournaments they have. Now there, there's a long tradition, eh, but, but maybe there's an opportunity to create a new tradition and to create more competitions. I mean, right now, everything's about the Larry O'Brien trophy and European soccer operates a little bit differently. They have other cups, which maybe aren't the equivalent of the championship, but in their own right are highly significant. And so those are the kinds of things, those aren't the changes that are gonna happen in a year and maybe you know, not even in, in two or three years, but the kinds of development for the league that need to be studied over time it's why we have a competition committee. I, so, so, and, and by the way, on, on, the, on the fresh look point, I mean, in all seriousness, I think whether it's a sports league or any industry or you know, your company, I assume you're constantly re-looking at the way you do things. And, and it may be because the acceleration of media because of the internet, look how quickly the Bleacher Report has emerged as a factor. I mean, so much news in sports whether it's in the NBA or other leagues, has been broken by, you know, I, I, don't, I don't want to say, you know, bloggers, I don't want to, you know, whether it's TMZ, frankly, Deadspin, Bleacher Report, the whole media landscape <clears throat> has changed. So I think we'd be crazy, you know, not to constantly be taking a fresh look at everything we do. The NBA had been among the leagues that actually sued the state of New Jersey trying to prevent expanded gambling on, on sports. Um, and it's been something that I think the sports leagues have generally been very, very reluctant to see. You have talked about this being almost an inevitability, the expanded legalized sports gambling. And, and your position is, I think, a little different than what the NBA has kind of stood for before, which is, hey, look, if it's coming anyway, embrace it, participate in it, and see where it meshes with your own goals. Can you explain how that can possibly mesh when, when the NBA has clearly been so opposed to, to that in the past? Yeah, well, well, first of all, our position in the case of the, the ongoing lawsuit in New Jersey is that there is federal legislation, PASPA, and that the bill that the state of New Jersey has passed is not consistent with the PASPA framework and therefore is ultimately unconstitutional. Um, or, or put differently, that PASPA is constitutional and that it's regulated by the federal government. Having said that, I do think that sports betting on a widespread legalized basis in the United States is inevitable, in part because states like New Jersey are pushing hard to generate additional revenue in the same way that lotteries have expanded to virtually every state now. I think sports betting will follow behind. My view is that if that is inevitable and it's gonna happen, that we need to participate in the regulatory framework that will be designed around our game. I mean, ultimately, we have the responsibility for the integrity of the game, to ensure the competition is pure, to ensure that no one around in the NBA family, whether that be at the league, a team, a referee, is in any way influenced by gamblers. We, of course, do all those things now, but frankly, because the industry is not transparent. We, we can't do as good a job, I believe, as we could if it were all highly regulated. I mean, for example, right now, there's a huge offshore online business in sports betting. If you go to Google, or now that I, Steve Ballmer reminded me the other day, now that he's an owner, if you go to Bing <laughs> and you put in bet, fill in the blank, yeah. sports league, you could spend your night looking at the various sites that ask people to enter their credit cards. And so there's no doubt there's a large, whether it's a gray area of the law or illegal area, what, that's happening right now. In addition, it is legal in Europe to bet on the NBA. We, of course, are enormously popular in many markets outside the United States where there's widespread betting on our games, legal betting on our games. And, and it's another ex area where there's a lot of learning to be had by the regulatory frameworks they have in places, they have in place in other areas of the world. So my view is if it's gonna happen, we should participate, we should have a seat at the table, we should be talking about the appropriate ways to regulate it and control it. In the same way, frankly, of course, it's legal in Nevada right now in a highly regulator regulatory framework. I don't wanna hide from the fact there are business benefits to it as well. 
Uh, if you look at, for example, the English Premier League, one of the largest categories for sponsorship are the betting companies. I mean, they're, whether it's on the jerseys, whether it's on the, the court side, the, the, the signs on the side of the pitch, you know, or the field, you know, and, and in, in that sport, obviously, where they don't have commercials, there's a, there's a whole different model. But there's a commercial opportunity as well. And I think that sports betting, if done in a, an appropriate regulatory environment, is not necessarily an evil. Right. I think that, you know, people, if you look at the popularity of office pools for NCAA tournaments, you know, weekend bets that people have in this country on other sports, it's, you know, of course there's the potential, and I think you have that no different than with alcohol or other substances, to, there's the potential for abuse. But I don't necessarily think that means that for the 95% of the population that can do it in a controlled, enjoyable way and be entertained by it, that it necessarily should therefore be excluded for everyone. Yeah, no, it certainly engages fans on a, on a whole other level when uh, they have that, have that bet on the table and, and they're, they're that much more interested. I, I understand the, the way it works in, in European soccer leagues. You can actually bet when you're even at the stadium. Is there going to be a day, maybe someday down the road, I'm not saying imminently, but where you go to an NBA arena and there's a window to go put your bet down? Well, it, it's a great question. And historically, for European soccer, you could bet at the stadiums. And, for example, at Wembley, I remember going years ago, and seeing the windows, the betting windows, right at the games, and think, my God, how different this is than in the United States. But what's happened now, and in a way very close to heart in terms of your business, it's all moved online. Mm -hmm. And so it, there are still some of those windows left, but even from a control and regulatory standpoint, the regulators would prefer that people bet online because when they bet online, it's through a credit card, sure. it's easier to identify the person, it's not just somebody walking up to a window and putting down cash. And so what you're seeing now at the stadiums is that an online has come to mean, for the most part, mobile. And it's not necessarily bets on who is gonna win the match, but it's more in the category of so-called proposition bets what's gonna happen in the first half or what's gonna happen in the first 10 minutes or you know all kinds of permutations on bets. And so what you see now at a lot of European soccer games is people on their smartphones placing bets during the games. And so while I don't think it's, we're, ne we're gonna move to a framework where we're gonna have betting windows in our arenas, I, you know, I think though as you see the way the world's going, you're gonna see people increasingly betting on tablets and phones and incidentally, I happen to see that all the time at games now. I mean, again, those sites are out there. I mean, I'm not even qualified in terms of their ultimate legality, but there, there's a lot of them out there right now. And I see fans all the time when I sit in the stands at games looking at their phones, looking at iPads, other tablets, and you can, you can see what they're doing and they're placing bets throughout the game. Another uh, wrinkle in the NBA this season that I thought I wanted to, to uh, have you address, because it's very interesting. Becky Hammond is going to be the first female full-time assistant coach with the San Antonio Spurs. Michelle Roberts was just hired by the union to be their executive director. That's a first. Uh, Lauren Holtkamp, another female referee, coming up to join Violet Palmer. It's an interesting kind of just uh, a, a, you know chain of events here all happening at once. Your league, this is happening, and I have not seen anything remotely uh, to this degree with the NFL, Major League Baseball. What do you think? Is there any theory you have why the NBA seems to have a, a, big, a different environment here where it seems like w women are really moving into all areas and, and is this the start of, of an even bigger wave coming uh, down the road? So I, I'm not qualified to comment on what's happening in other leagues. I'd say in terms of the NBA, so much credit goes to David Stern and to our owners and to the family around this league. It's a very progressive environment. I think, I, you know, Coach Pop, you know, he, I think he's, he's built the kind of excellence there by making decisions on talent and that are, that are neutral of nationality, ethnicity, color, you name it. And I think we're seeing, it, it's, it's a little embarrassing that for steps that frankly, are not that progressive that we should be getting any credit, but I'm, I'm honored to be part of it, and I think that ultimately 
it's my job and the league office's job to set the right culture throughout the league. So um, I think it is a byproduct of that. I think that if you look at the track record of the NBA going back well before I was ever involved in the league and even before David Stern was ever involved in the league, there's been a lot of firsts that have happened in this league in terms of African-American general managers, African-American coaches, African-American principal owners, um, and hopefully the next step you're seeing in terms of gender real advancement as well. But, but it's something we talk about a lot at the league office. It's something we talked about in our just recent set of owners meetings. There were lots of discussions about inclusion and diversity, respect in the workplace, and so we are very focused on it. And I, I mean, I, I couldn't be happy for Becky Hammond, but Spurs said it just right. This, they weren't looking, I think, to you know, you know, put a marker down in the history books they're looking to win championships. Yeah. And I think ultimately, that's what inclusion and diversity um, are, are about, and that is competing at the highest level. And I, and I think the best organizations realize that to be the best, you have to have the greatest pool of applicants and hire the best. We're coming down toward the end of our time here, but I've got some lightning round quick hit questions. By the way, I, I got a little more time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good. Well, I, I appreciate that. We'll, we'll, uh, it won't be quite lightning. I've given, I've, I had be, long uh, answers, so you Slow go speed lightning. Yeah. Okay. Uh, freeze frame. Uh, your all-time starting five in the NBA. Any era? Not fair. <laughs> you know, I, I work for one of them, and that's Michael Jordan, because <laughs> he's one of the 30 owners. So he's on the court. The reason I, can't, I don't feel comfortable answering that question is because I have too many friends over my 22 plus years in the league to be picking and choosing. Yeah. Um, of course, Mr. Russell, you know, somebody else who I, I have the good fortune of working with on a regular basis, he would be there too, but I'm going to stop there because I'm going to only get myself in trouble. All right, fair enough, fair enough. I don't want you to offend any of your, uh, your friends in the league, obviously. Um, although, speaking of which, and I think you and I discussed this once before, you have met, obviously, players of, of all kind of stature, of all kinds of fame from all across the, the history of the league. Who have you met that you were actually intimidated by, nervous to meet? Bill Russell, still. I think from my early days in the league, I remember my, my father told me a story. My father is no longer alive. When I first came to the NBA, told me a story about how, how he and my oldest brother, Eric, had waited outside the old garden in New York to get Bill Russell's autograph and how Bill, when Bill Russell had come out, he had barked at them because, of course, he notoriously doesn't sign autographs. So I was thinking, Dad, didn't you know that back then? Like, I hope it wasn't cold out that you were standing out there waiting. But um, I think only because Bill had, he was so, you know, he's so legendary, he's so accomplished. I mean, and he's lived so much history. I mean, back to some of the you know, some of the early milestones we were talking about before. I mean, he was there, you know, when Martin Luther King, you know, made his famous civil rights speech, you know, in Washington, D.C. And, and so he, he intimidates me a little bit as a historical figure just because he's seen so much. And as I always say to people, you know, about the NBA, they forget what a young league we are. I mean, it's, it's like if you worked in baseball and somebody said, um, you want to sit with Babe Ruth, you know, at a game. That's what, to me, it's like sitting with Bill Russell. Yeah. Now, your job is obviously all-consuming. I don't know if there's time for anything else, but what are you doing when you're not watching basketball or otherwise managing the league? Any outside hobbies? Well, um, I, I enjoy running still. I think, you know, I've run two marathons over the years. I'm, I'm not running such long distances anymore, but I try to find time to run. Um, I'm fortunate to live near Central Park, and I have a dog. I have a Labr Labrador Retriever, and... In New York, one of the greatest things about New York City is that before 9 a.m. and after 9 p.m., you don't have to have your dog on its leash on its leash in Central Park. So that's sort of a really fun kind of hobby, you know, relaxation for me, going into the park with my dog and throwing the ball and stuff like that. I, I don't watch as much non-sports television as I used to. I, I find that it's pretty all-consuming when with the amount of NBA programming on, the amount of... NBA coverage there is on the internet, but I love movies. You know, I, I, I try to get to as many movies as I can. Last one you saw? Oh my God, that's such an unfair question. 
I'll, I got to think for a second. <laughs> we can we can move on. Uh, Steve Ballmer, new one over the LA Clippers. You mentioned him earlier. A very uh, energetic guy. Describe him in uh, 20 words or less. <laughs> <laughs> he is the most enthusiastic person I've ever met. I sat with him at a Clippers game before he bought the team, and he was bellowing so loud. I mean, I, I generally don't sit with owners at games, but he wasn't an owner there. But people kept looking around like, what's that noise emanating from my row? And it was Steve yelling and screaming and just with crazy enjoyment and enthusiasm during the game. But I should say on a serious note, he's extraordinarily smart. Again, he just attended his first Board of Governors meetings. He asked a lot of really good probing questions about materials. And I, as I said to him afterwards, talk about a fresh look. I think when you have a new set of eyes on materials that we've been historically giving to teams, whether it's the way we present our financials, whether it's the way we talk about basketball, and it's somebody as accomplished as Steve Ballmer, somebody who you know, was the CEO of one of the most successful companies in the world. It's like, please, you know, come in the tent and like make suggestions to us. Yeah. Uh, we talked a little bit about innovation. So three things that are still on the Adam Silver board, of, not things that have to happen, just things you'd like the NBA to at least consider. The format of the season is something I'm very focused on. And whether that means expanding it in a way that um, allows more rest for the players over the course of the season, means starting a little bit earlier, maybe going a little bit later. That's one of the things on my list. Um, as we just did two new media deals in the United States. Obviously, we, we renewed with our great partners at, at Turner and ESPN and ABC. But I think there are enormous opportunities international, internationally, and, and not just revenue generating, but for much more comprehensive coverage. And that's as much about what these new deals were about. I was just recently in China. There's some media companies there that literally blow away anything that's happening in the United States in terms of the numbers of users of those, of those apps on social media, the kinds of technology they're using. Um, so that's, in, that's incredibly fascinating to me. And I'd say lastly, just, just to name three, I, I continue to be consumed with the way um, we can be represented digitally around the world. Uh, it's something I talk about a lot, and that is, well, the in-arena experience is critically important, and especially if you're watching a game on TV, if there's not an excited crowd around the game, you know, it's, you're, you're not necessarily to be as, enthu as enthusiastic a viewer if you don't see people excited to be there. But having said that, such a minuscule fraction of our fans ever get to experience our game in the arena, not just in the United States, but I mean, we're, we're in the United States, but more so internationally. And I think the ultimate goal is, how do we replicate that experience? How do we make it feel when you're watching a game on television, when you have whatever mobile devices, tablets and phones with you, that you have that sense that you're part of that larger community, that people are yelling and screaming, that you can react, that you can pick angles, you can look at replays. That, that to me, you know, making, enhancing that experience for people who are watching through whatever form of media is on the top of my, is at the top of my agenda as well. Right. Before we let you go, we want to look a little bit even further ahead into the future here. 2024, 10 years down the road, a few predictions, and don't worry, we're not going to hold you to these. But uh, true or false, 2024, in the year 2024, there will be a female head coach in the NBA. True. 2024, the NBA will have teams in Europe. Oh. I'm I know not. it's on the 10-year rolling cycle that David put out there 20 years ago, but... I, I, you know, I don't want to pretend I can predict the future. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Um, true or false, there will be more teams in the United States in 2024. I think it's possible teams could be in some different markets, but expansion is not on our agenda right now. So I won't send the uh, congratulations card to Seattle just yet? <laughs> you know, it, it's a difficult issue because I, I don't want to prejudge it. I think 30 teams feels right. At the moment, again, though, I don't want to predict the influx of great players. I mean, part of it, it's not just a financial issue, but it's a competitive issue. Mm -hmm. And we're, as you and I talked about the, at the beginning of this session, we're seeing more competitive teams than we've had any time in history. Just a few years ago, reporters like you were writing that this diluted league wasn't producing great competition every night. So the last thing I want to do is quickly talk about adding more teams. 
Okay. Um, I know I'm not working in your form. No, that's I okay. We're not, yeah, we're not quite <laughs> on the lightning part of it. We've got to speed you up. Um, all right. In the year 2024, the NBA will have a true minor league system, 30 D League teams with 30 affiliations with the uh, top NBA teams. True. True. That would be, that would be a great move. Um, in the year 2024, LeBron James will have equaled Michael Jordan with six championships. I'm not making any predictions. <laughs> <laughs> no, no championship calls. That's, that's fair enough. Uh, easier one for you here, I think. In the year 2024, Greg Popovich will have retired as coach of the San Antonio Spurs and will be a sideline reporter for one of the networks. <laughs> True. That would, be, that would be the greatest thing, wouldn't it? Absolutely. I would, I would love to see him turn the tables. And finally, in the year 2024, Adam Silver will be commissioner of the NBA. Boy, that's the last prediction I'm going to make. I mean, and especially I'm not going to speak for our owners. All I can say is I'm fully engaged right now, and I love my job. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Adam Silver. Adam Silver, Commissioner of the NBA, here with us at Bleacher Report. Thank you, Howard. Adam, thank you.